So, um, welcome. Welcome to all of you from all over the world who's joining. We have uh, 38 countries uh, signed up for this session, so it's very exciting. Uh, it's a wide group of uh, NGOs, universities, researchers, journalists, government officials um, from all over the world um, watching the uh, webinar we have today. So welcome all of you and welcome to the uh, panelists who will be um, panelists and moderator who will be introduced uh, very shortly. So um, I'm just going to bid you welcome and um, these Alliance uh, sessions have been uh, running now for a month during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, crisis and um, it really comes from our members who have been calling for us to understand a little bit more about how they can connect with other uh, groups, other vendors and other STPs um, and um, in that uh, sort of context we have tried to invite a number of people who know about areas other than the road safety sphere and who's working outside not just the road safety sphere but are connecting with uh, some of the other STPs and today uh, the topic is around gender, around gender and road safety and mobility and um, wish you welcome and um, wish you a very good session. Welcome and thanks. Thank you, Lotte, and uh, welcome to everybody. So welcome to this live session on gender and mobility. Uh, today, I'm Eric. I'm Eric Ramak from Brussels. I'm working with Plan International, and uh, I'll be the moderator for this session. And I'm very happy that today we have the chance to have three uh, great panelists. panelists. Um, the first will be, that I will introduce will be Naomi Mora Fione. Uh, Naomi, you have been the, you are the founder of uh, the Flung Initiative that is willing to hand violence against girls uh, in public transport. Maybe could you share a, a word uh, about yourself? Um, yes. So hi, I'm Naomi Mora. Um, um, our work basically we work in um, Kenya. Um, yes, I'm not sure what else to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. You're also the co-founder of the Mama Africa Film Festival. You are also a member of the African Network of, uh, for Women in Infrastructure of the African Union Commission. Oh, so, yes, uh, I've worked on gender and mobility issues for now uh, six years. Yeah. Uh, I've worked on gender and mobility issues in uh, Kenya, Uganda, um, and Cairo so far in the African continent. Um, yeah, and I'm very happy to be here. So thanks a lot for joining us today. Um, Marie-Axel Granier, you are Director of Research in uh, Social Developmental Psychology at the Gustave Eiffel University in France. Uh, you have been working the last 20 years on relationship to risk and traffic rules in constructed through individual life and in particular to understand gender difference in risk behavior and traffic violation. You are one of the key expert and uh, the current vice chair of the expert committee of the National Road Safety Council in France. Uh, you are for many one very important reference when we speak about road safety mm -hmm. and gender, uh, an inspiration for a lot of us and a pioneer in, uh, in this field. So thank you for joining us today. You want to share something more about yourself today? Uh, no, thank you. It's very flattering. Uh, I hope to not uh, disappoint you uh, after. <laughs> After that, <laughs> I'm sure you won't. And, uh, and the third panelist is the uh, Water Stays. Water is uh, is working also with Plan International. He is the uh, and is the advocacy coordinator, and he's specifically looking at um, a project called uh, Safer Cities that he will tell us about. Uh, but also, Water mm -hmm. is also uh, an activist. Let's say. Uh, in the field of children's rights and girls' rights for more than a decade. He's also the president of the Belgium Dutch Speaking Child Rights Coalition and is a motivating uh, person to work with because he is also one of my colleagues at Plan International Belgium. What, do you like something to, to add something about uh, your profile today? Yeah, thank you for that uh, nice introduction, Eric, um, and uh, good afternoon or good morning, good evening to, to everyone who is attending. Really nice to see such a diverse public. Um, 
Yeah, I think uh, the introduction of, uh, of Eric was already really good. Um, I think throughout the, uh, the session, I'll be able to, uh, to explain some more things on the, the work we're doing on the, within our Safer Cities program. Um, I have to say I'm uh, specifically um, coordinating the advocacy work we're doing um, in the, uh, in, on a national level, so in Belgium, but uh, we do have some links, of course, with the international program as well. So I'll try to, uh, to uh, tell you something about those two parts. Thanks a lot, Walter. So the idea really of the session today is to give a kind of holistic, uh, to, 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 um, to, to have a, a discussion about an holistic approach towards safety and, uh, and mobility. That's why here we have, we have invited panelists that come from more academic or road safety background, but also people that are really specialized on everything in relation with gender-based violence in the, in the mobility. Um, so that's why, so the time is short and I think all of us, we have specifically you panelists, of course, you have a lot of things to share with the public. So I will start with the first questions. The first question is, we are here speaking about gender and mobility. Uh, does that mean that people experience of mobility is influenced by gender uh, dynamics and what are the gaps when it comes to risk factors uh, when, about mobility and genders? So could you explain us a little bit? What's the relationship between mobility, gender, gaps, and risk? Uh, the risk and what are the gaps? Sorry. Um, maybe we will start with you, Maria Axel. Sorry, mute. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I just prepared some slides. Uh, it is possible to share. I hope you, uh, you uh, can see. Yes. Mm. Uh, so, um, concerning the gender difference in mobility, uh, there is uh, effectively a gender difference in the mode uh, that are used, in the patterns of travel, and in the risk associated with uh, mobility. Uh, first of all, uh, studies generally show that more women than men have no mode of transport available at all at, and uh, are obliged to walk. More women than men are depending on public means of transport. Women are less likely than men to have access to motorized means of transport, and women are less likely than men to use bicycles and other intermediate means of transport. In the majority of industrialized uh, countries, men are much more likely to be car drivers than women, while women are more likely to be car passengers and workers. More women than men use public transport, especially to go to work, and also men use trains more than women. In the countries from the global south, the lack of access to transport services affects women more than, than men. They can spend long hours carrying water and walking from two, two farm plots. In some areas where water is scarce, Due to time-consuming water collection, girls are uh, half as likely as boys to attend school. Carrying loads on their head is a major health risk for women. They may suffer a higher accident rate when walking on congested roads with heavy loads. But uh, there is also a um, difference in um, um, travel patterns, sorry. Uh, men travel for work-related reasons, while women also travel for non-work-related places, such as, such as shops, schools, health centers, and daycare centers. Women are also more dependent on public transport than men, especially when they have low incomes. They generally make shorter, more frequent, and more scattered trips during the day. Women are also frequently accompanied by children or elderly parents and carry bulky loads for errands. Women's complex household and carrying responsibilities usually require them to make multiple stops. Men and women experience also different risks in their mobilities. First, there are considerable gender differences in personal safety. I think Naomi will talk about that. Women are more vulnerable to attack and harassment than men, and they may deter them from using public transportation. Many women simply avoid traveling after dark. Finally, 
there are also large differences between men and women in the world of crashes. Globally, almost three times more males than females die from road crashes. This is the largest sex difference in mortality rates from unintentional injury. This increased risk of fatal crashes for men is observed in all regions of the world and in all age groups and mostly in all transportation modes. However, all other things being equal, women have a higher risk of lower limb injuries because their small size is not yet well considered by vehicle manufacturers. There are more frequent crashes uh, in males are related to greater risk exposure, particularly as a motor vehicle driver, more frequent use of alcohol, more frequent offenses and crash risk behaviors. These crashes also have different consequences for men and women. Women may find it difficult to arrange childcare or to pay for domestic help in their absence. It should also be considered that men are often the sole providers of household income. Their injury or death means a loss of income endangering the family and additional work for the mother. Thank you, Marie Axel. Um, Walter, what do you think? Um, thank you, Eric. Um, I hope I'll dig in a little bit deeper on something that uh, Marie Axel uh, has just already uh, touched a little bit. It's about these safety issues and the differences that um, uh, men and women uh, experiences experience when. Um, traveling through their city, um, be it by, a, by the use of public transport, by bicycle, or, um, or by just walking. Um, maybe to start off, it's, it's good to know that um, throughout the world, it's not always easy to find really uh, clear data on, uh, on, road, on road safety and, for example, sexual harassment, um, specific, mm -hmm. specifically disaggregated data that is um, um, specifically for, for a city or um, an age uh, difference, etc. So it's not always easy to find really good data. Um, that's why at the start of our uh, program, Safe in Cities program that um, specifically aims to, uh, to build safe, accountable and inclusive cities, that's why we started off by doing the research to look, uh, to look into the experiences of um, youngsters, so between 15 and 24 years old, on their safety in, uh, in public space. Um, why did we uh, choose that topic specifically? Well, um, as Eric told you in the introduction, we're a children's rights organization. And as all of you are aware, in the, because you're all in, um, working in the transport field, um, it's a basic right to, to be able to transport yourself. So that's already a fundamental right. But of course, the ability to, um, uh, well, Transport is really essential, not just as a right itself, but also to get to our different other rights, to get to our family, to get to supermarkets, to get to clean water, to get to a healthcare system. So it's really important that we, um, uh, the thing that we're discussing today, that uh, everyone can get to access to all those different rights in a safe way. Maybe just as a little introduction, I can tell you about the research we've done on safety experiences in public space. And one of the, one of the main um, really, well, a little bit shocking results is that not less than 91% of the uh, Belgian girls in three cities where we did the research, 91% of the girls has already had um, experiences with sexual harassment in the public space. That is um, compared to 28% of the boys who have been victim of at least one form of, uh, of sexual harassment. Just for the information for this research, we based ourselves on the, the Belgian um, uh, definition of sexual harassment, um, being all verbal, nonverbal, or uh, and physical behavior that is experienced as uh, insulting, menacing, or intimidating. Um, these results are in line with, uh, with other researches, both in Belgium, but also worldwide, that there's really a big difference um, between the experiences of girls and young women, and women overall, and boys, on the other hand, when it comes to um, experiences of sexual harassment. Maybe one more um, 
interesting result that came out of the research as well is the places that are uh, that are most at, that um, youngsters feel most at risk uh, of being a victim of, uh, of sexual harassment. And there, there's actually two places which they um, uh, defined. The first one being really deserted places, like the picture um, that was uh, shown you earlier by Maria Excel. So really the, the dark uh, places where there isn't a lot of uh, social control. Um, so where there's less chance that a, a witness or a bystander could intervene, less chance that a police officer or someone, uh, the, the bus driver could, uh, could see you, could intervene. So that's the one place that was uh, defined in the, in the research. The other uh, place is actually a bit the, the opposite. So places that are crowded or even overcrowded uh, with public, um, including public transport, including nightlife, including some shopping streets where, um, where harassers feel um, invisible or uh, because there's so, just so many people around that they can get away with harassing people or they feel uh, legitimized by, um, by the situation because um, people are standing so close to each other, crammed together on a, on a public transport, for example. Um, so this is, uh, these are things that come from a research we've done in Belgium. But it's interesting to know maybe for you that to, to start um, or to, to do this research, we actually based um, our questions and our work on the inputs from our colleagues in Hanoi, in Hanoi uh, Vietnam who've um, done a research uh, like this, and who've actually really come out with, with very similar uh, results. For example, on the, on the bus stops, that's, that's one of the, uh, the bus stops, and on the bus itself, that's, it's one of the hotspots for sexual harassment. So we're really, where possible, we really try to align our work with, uh, with our international colleagues. Thank you, Walter. Naomi, I think you are involved in a, in a, in a program, uh, you lead a program that has similar goals than the Safer City project. Could you, could you tell us a little bit uh, what do you do, what did you start, uh, what are the, the, this gender issue that we, with a, that we can observe in your context in Kenya? Uh, okay. Um, so we started Flon Initiative as uh, four girlfriends in uh, university. So we were all uh, university students at that time. And every time we would meet, we would have discussions about our experiences using public transport. And after a while, we decided, OK, we can do something small. Um, and actually, Flown Initiative is named after our parents <laughs> because we were trying to bribe them into allowing us to use pocket money to run the organization, <laughs> which worked. Um, and so we've been working on creating safer spaces on, and also uh, creating research on what was our lived experiences. When we were starting, there was not a lot of uh, research on the issue, but it's something we strongly felt that there was an issue and it needed to be addressed and nobody else at that time was doing it. And so we took it upon ourselves um, to get started. And I am quite uh, impressed by the fact that all the panelists have mentioned the same issues that we are facing in Kenya. So that's uh, pretty impressive that we are continent apart, but we still can relate on the gender and mobility issues. Um, I'd like to start off by saying that a street or a road or a public transport vehicle is not, is not just a way to get to and from point A to B it is a stage where human interactions occur. And these interactions can either be positive or negative. And for most women and girls, these interactions are negative. And let me paint a picture of the context in Kenya. Women make up uh, about 52% of the population, but only 7% of the workers in public transport are women. But at the same time, we find that women make majority of public transport users but they are captive users. Once they have enough money and savings to buy a personal car, that's the first thing they do. They do not invest in uh, land. Um, and so you see there's need to improve public transport because the negative experiences have a ripple effect. And we found out that women who live in households with private cars 
we found out that only 10% have access to dry bit, right? Um, and as my colleague, uh, my colleagues mentioned, is that women face a disproportionate amount of safety concerns and the majority being the fear of sexual harassment, right? And in the modern world where women and girls are moving out of homes more and more to just access jobs, to get an education, to access uh, healthcare, it's important that this public transport is able to get women to where they need to go. Um, and also the experiences of women and girls in public spaces can also be extended to other vulnerable groups, for example, children, the elderly, and people with disability, because according to our research, we found that women tend to accompany these vulnerable groups. So we conducted a mobility of care research in Nairobi, which is uh, the capital city of uh, Kenya. And we found that there are different motives of why women prefer different modes of transport. So in Kenya, most of the public transport is not really public transport, it's private public transport. It's public transport run by private people, individuals. And we categorize the motives for preferring a certain mode of transport into five. There's convenience, safety, comfort, and reliability. And we found that women would go or end cost. So we find out that women will choose public uh, modes of transport that are safe and reliable, despite the fact that that means that most of these modes are also more expensive. And then when we looked at the prevalence of harassment, we found that it was quite prevalent and almost normalized. And you find that majority of respondents in this uh, mobility of research, for example, you find that both managers and operators and commuters, over 70% of them say they had heard of or witnessed cases of uh, violence or harassment in their respective routes. And you, we've also found out that these instances of harassment normally happen at bus stations while the women are waiting to board the public transport vehicles. And we also looked at the forms of harassment. So there are various forms. I'll talk about it, uh, this in another, um, um, in another time. Uh, but we found that inappropriate physical contact was the most common, followed by use of abusive language. And the least common but most severe was the stripping uh, or undressing of women commuters. So this is undressing them off, stripping them off of their dressing. So that was the most severe and the least common. Um, I, I, I don't know if at this point I should talk about this, but I do feel that when it comes to this question, the main risk with gender and mobility is the belief that there's a single solution that can improve women's access to public transport. There is no silver bullet and there's no single solution. Mm -hmm. no, I think and, have... okay. Sorry, it's okay. I, I could talk about this forever if you let me. <laughs> I think I think we agree on that, and and I think that's a little bit the, the, the really the spirit of the session, saying that it's no if we want everybody to feel safe within the mobility system, we need to have a comprehensive understanding of what's going on and mm -hmm. an holistic approach to solve those problems. And this include uh, the needs of specialists for road safety of gender-based violence in those different fields. You mm -hmm. all have agree on the fact that gender is a significant factor when we are when we are when we analyze the situation and specifically risk when it comes to mobility. Uh, no, I would I like you to explain us a little bit more. Um, what? How could we? How do we explain those differences in terms of experience uh, within the transportation system by gender? Uh, Marie Axel, maybe a word on that. Why is that so? Why is it so structured through gender? Uh, yes, just two more slides. 
um, um, what I um, what I see in the research on the domain is that gender differences in mobility needs are strongly related to the division of labor in the families and the societies. In almost all societies, the stereotypical role of men is that uh, of a breadwinner who leaves home to work in the morning and returns it in the evening. Women, however, generally assume a triple role, breadwinner, housewife, and community manager, providing care for the youngest and the oldest members of the family. Access to motorized transport itself is also determined by cultural roles. Around the world, car ownership is associated with success, power, and social status. Even in car-owning households, it is often only men who drive. The various studies show that even if they are heads of the household or employed, women have less access, access to motor vehicles and are less likely to have a driving license than men. This difference is most significant in urban areas and means that women are more dependent on public transport than men. Gender roles also affect the behavior of men and women in their mobility. Male stereotypes value competition, domination, and risk-taking, often perceived as a sign of virility. Boys are therefore, from early in childhood, used to face their fears, to have confidence in their physical abilities, to feel invulnerable, to take risks. Female stereotypes value caring for others, obedience, compliance with adults, and rules. Girls are educated at an early age to obey adult demands, to avoid risk, and to comply with rules. This has an impact on risk-taking in general, which women avoid much more than men, and all the more so in traf road traffic, where risk-taking and offenses are often lifted up. Overall, women's access to vehicles and services is often more constrained by social cultural convention than by physical barriers. The particularity of transportation fields is that it combines the effect of gender role with beliefs and stereotypes directly related to the field. This is undoubtedly due to the fact that mod mobility is also a means of freedom and empowerment that societies ve find very difficult to accept from women. Ways to travel far away from home are from the outset the object of beliefs that they are incompatible with femininity and the role of women. This is especially true for cycling. It represents an attractive alternative mode of travel for short and medium distances and chain journeys. Unfortunately, it has been long been shown as a risk of virilization of women, as this quote from the end of the 19th century shows. I let you uh, read it, but uh, unfortunately, that's still the case today. In industrialized uh, societies, girls still often stop riding bicycles at puberty. Women's use of bicycles is also not well perceived in the countries from the global south. In Mozambique, for example, bicycles offered to women have been taken back by their husbands, and women's resistance may have led to domestic violence. In male-dominated local cultures, women bicycle use could be seen as inappropriate and unfeminine, describing this woman as virile and unfit to marriage. These beliefs, also, uh, beliefs ob ob obviously also affect the use of car. From the beginning, driving is seen as unfeminine, too messy, and requiring quick decision making and emotional control that women do not possess. Driving is too dangerous for women, and women are too dangerous to drive, as explained in this quote of the 19, uh, beginning of the, uh, of the 20th century. In, in uh, his uh, histori historical um, essay, Berger, uh, in uh, 1986, uh, um, quotes that um, uh, these stereotypes survive more as a joke, uh, as a joke, joke. but uh, unfortunately, stereotypes of women behind the wheel are still prevalent today. Studies have shown that these social beliefs all are already shared from childhood in industrial, uh, industrialized countries. Men are seen as naturally competent drivers, 
which is expressed by their risk-taking behind the wheel, whereas women's caution and compliance are seen as a sign for their intrinsic incompetence to drive. As women have learned to feel vulnerable, these beliefs affect their access to different travel modes. Largely spread and shared, they affect women's self-confidence in their skills and can explain why they choose not to drive, not to ride, or not to cycle, even when they have the opportunity to do so. Because these transportation modes are considered to be too dangerous for them, by the men, but also by the women themselves. They also, affect the, on the, uh, they also have effects on the individual travel behaviors. For women, the fear of crash will lead to cautious and low bidding behavior. Whereas for the men, the sense of competence and self-confidence will lead to more driving uh, risk taking. These are the uh, simple and easy way to confirm men's virility, but they also lead to their own representation in crash. Thank you. Oh, I'm not on mute. Um, what, are, what will be your explanation about the so important difference that we can observe in terms of gender experience in mobility related to gender? Yeah. Uh, I think we, uh, in plan, we also work, we really start from the same premise that uh, Maria Excel just explained about the, the stereotypes mm -hmm. that, um, uh, that are still taking place worldwide and are still existing in pretty much all societies. Um, maybe to, to answer your specific question, because we actually, um, in our research, we actually asked the youngsters as well, like, what do you think are the, the main reasons why, um, why, har why harassment still takes place? And on the number one was um, the thing that Marie Excel already explained profoundly, or the, the stereotypes, the fact that it, that it is a behavior that is uh, seen as normal, that it is what it is expected um, in some parts of society. Um, so I won't go into uh, too, uh, too deep into that one. There were two um, other main uh, things that the, the youngsters pointed out that are um, cause, causing the fact that the, this harassment still exists. Um, the first one being um, ignorance or uh, lack of knowledge on the, on the part of the harassers, um, where they are not aware of the fact that what they're doing is experienced as harassment by the victim and by the law. Just to be clear, this is um, part for so this is the case for some parts of sexual harassment. So, of course, not the um, the very extreme physical parts of sexual harassment, but more the ones like um, uh, uh, non-verbal and verbal, um, the, the the stalking part, the uh, the trying to flirt, but being really obsessive about it. Those things. Um, not every harasser is aware of the fact that it is not appreciated, that, is, that it is felt as harassment by, by victims, and that um, in Belgium at least it is considered as uh, illegal once the, the victim has um, either verbally or non-verbally showed that uh, he or she doesn't appreciate that kind of behavior. So that's the first thing that the unawareness of what is actually the, the feeling of the victim and what is considered um, okay behavior by the law as well, that, uh, that doesn't exist with, uh, with all harassers. Um, so it's really important to, um, to organize sensibilization campaigns about the definition and the impact uh, really on those parts um, of sexual harassment, both with the aim of, uh, to stop harassers but also to, um, to uh, lower the barrier for victims um, to, to actually file a complaint. And that's a little bit the, the bridge to the, the second point. Um, there's uh, a really a, a great lack of, um, of punishments, of uh, follow-up um, by the justice system um, when it comes to, to forms of sexual harassment. Um, from our research, we, uh, we found that only um, 6% of the victim, victims of sexual harassment um, actually find an official complaint uh, at the police. Um, so that's really a, a, an enormous dark number. Um, so it's really important not, to, uh, not to, to put the blame on the victim, of course, oh, you should be the one that, that files a complaint, etc. No, not at all. But instead to, to really lower the barriers 
um, for victims of sexual harassment to, to find help. Because um, it wasn't just the, the fact that there's very few complaints. Um, it's also the, the fact that so many victims of, um, of sexual harassment actually don't have any place to go. We saw that um, just under 50% of the victims actually um, had someone to go to, most of them being family or uh, close friends. But if you look at like the official um, organizations that are there to help victims of harassment, that only five, six percent of the youngsters who are victim actually go to these organizations. So there's a, an enormous work to go there um, to, um, well, to, to uh, both to, to get the definition clear, but also to, uh, to help uh, victims to, to get to the right organizations to find help uh, and file a complaint so we can do something about it structurally. Um, maybe um, it's a little bit linked. I saw a, a question in the in the chat uh, earlier um, from uh, from Jeff. I think it was who asked: um, uh, Is there a possibility for um, people to use social media to uh, to um, indicate where there where there has been a problem? Um, I think that's uh, that's something that, that came out of that same question. That indeed social media is uh, is used a lot for that. Um, and based on, on that uh, response, we actually um, launched uh, a few months ago, we launched a digital platform, um, which I will send the link of in a, in a little bit. It's, it's in English, French, Dutch, Dutch Spanish, um, so a couple of different languages where um, youngsters can indicate in which places of their city, so it's in the three cities in Belgium and three in, in Spain, because we're in a cooperation with Spain, so they can indicate on the platform on which places they feel safe um, and what kind of, of, um, of aspects make it that a certain uh, area in, the, in their city feels like a safe area. So we can really take those good practices with us as well. But also which part of the city um, uh, they had negative experiences in or they, have a, um, they don't feel safe walking around or uh, taking the bus on certain times of the day. Um, and we, it's, it's only been launched for, for a couple of months, but we've already seen a, a really um, big amount of, of inputs um, from youngsters. So, it, the, yeah, working through, the, through social media, through platforms, it's really uh, something that really works well. Um, and uh, I think that um, maybe Naomi can, can say something about that as well, because I, uh, I noticed that uh, they, um, you also have a, a report it and stop it um, program. Yeah. I think there's um, a, a little similarity there. Yes, um, but also I wanted to say in terms of the power of social media, for example, in Kenya, we had uh, what I think so far is one of the biggest protests in the country, which was called My Dress, My Choice, which was a protest against the um, against violence in public transport and thanks like this um, protest was organized solely through facebook through social media so it started off in a women's only group on facebook and then it led to actually an offline uh, protest and so i don't i think we should not underestimate the power of social media and also for example, the protest was also funded by people on social media. It was not funded by a, like um, an organization. So people on social media sent the money to the organizers. Um, and thanks to the protest, this, it led to a law in Kenya that made uh, stripping, which is a form of violence that's specific to the Kenyan public transport, it made it uh, punishable up to 10 years. And afterwards, the government followed up with arresting the perpetrators who, you know, whose incident now led to the protest. And um, the perpetrators were um, charged with, um, you know, the various offenses and also including the new law that was passed, but they were also sentenced to death penalty. And in Kenya, there is actually no death penalty. What it means is that they, uh, they will get a life imprisonment. And this was a very strong message that the Kenyan government was sending that violence against women in public transport will not be tolerated and will be heavily punished. So in terms of what you talked about, our platform reported Stop It. Uh, so we 
as I mentioned, when we first started, there was no data, and yet we were very sure as uh, women in Kenya that there was an issue. So we started the Report It, Stop It um, platform. And what we would do is that once somebody reports, depending on the hotspots, we would go to that hotspot and train operators on professionalism and gender rights mainstreaming in their work. And you've mentioned a bit uh, of that. And in Kenya, there is no official uh, training school for public transport operators. And the example I give is that Let's say, for example, you give somebody who's never used a laptop before and you tell them just type out this handwritten note. Right? So there are various options to that uh, scenario. They could, you could come back and find out they've opened a million tabs. You could come back and find out they've uh, pulled out some keys. You could come back and find out that they've given the note to somebody else to type it out for them. And I think it's the same thing we do with public transport operators. We give them a public transport or a public service job where on a day-to-day -day basis, they handle about 130 passengers minimum with no training whatsoever. All you tell them is you need to get from point A to B and I need this amount of money, which is about uh, $50 per day from you. And we get very surprised when they suck at their job. We do not equip them to be good at their job. Um, and so that's part of the work we do. Uh, we have a program called Usalama Uma, which in English means public safety training, where we train public transport operators on customer service, um, road safety, uh, and also sensitize them on sexual harassment. And from this, we help them develop customer service charters and sexual harassment policies. Yeah, over to you, moderator. Thank you, thank you. Um, um, so here, w when we address this question, I think we can all agree on the importance of tackling social norm to, uh, yeah. to deal with, with this issue. Now, um, the public also around and um, have been also suggesting the importance for this, let's say, holistic approach to safety and to take into account from prevention till first aids when it comes to road safety. Because, you know, in, in road safety, we really see that, let's say, as a life cycle of, the, uh, of personality within the, within, the, within the mobility system. Now, um, I'll, I'll ask some key questions. Um, here we speak about improving uh, safety, the experience of safety for all passengers. Uh, here we see that there is a, a serious um, uh, distinction and uh, an impact of gender dynamics uh, on those issues. What will be for you three key advice, three key practical projects that could be really put in place to, in order to improve this safety experience for all uh, people, for everybody in the mobility system? What would be really the, your three key advice? Uh, maybe starting with you, Walter. Oh. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll maybe start with one and go in depth on that, and I will see if we have enough time for the <laughs> for the two. Um, like one of the one of the main um, possibilities to uh, to change something structurally is actually to to counter the fact that the the people who are still currently in charge of um, uh, of mobility, of uh, public transport, um, of uh, like policy actors in total, is still mostly men um, and men of a, of a certain of a certain age as well. So it's really important on one hand to really get a more diverse public within uh, within boards, within organizations that are working on uh, on public transport, on uh, um, uh, public on, on street safety, etc. In transport in general, yes. Sorry? In transport in general. Yes. In transport in general, absolutely. Um, but we, we shouldn't be just waiting until that's the case because we, we see that that movement is going pretty slowly. In the meantime, a good practice that we've um, really been working on the last uh, years is um, really meaningful, well, trying to have as meaningful youth participation as possible. So to create this direct contact between girls and young women on the one hand, and policy actors in the field of transportation and city development in the other hand. 
not just the symbolic participation, but really uh, to include the, the target group, to, to include the, the group throughout the process. Um, and we actually did that in, um, in five very uh, concrete, we actually do that in five very concrete steps in our program. Um, so we uh, are a safer cities program. We accompany a city for, during two years um, to, uh, to uh, well, first analyze, uh, analyzes, etc. But at the start of the program, we actually form a, youth, a group of youngsters that learn about sexual harassment, about positive masculinities, etc. Through um, 12 sessions throughout the year. And those youngsters are really like the core of the program and they make sure that the, that, um, the policy actors can really get the, the immediate voice from, um, from youngsters that they can finally get those inputs. Second, a, okay. yeah. One question for you, because Naomi yeah. was speaking, for example, in the, in the situation of Kenya, and that's also something that came also uh, on certain of the, of the comments from Marie Axel. Uh, when we speak, for example, about uh, public transport, we realize that a majority of the users are women in many, in many countries. Mm -hmm. and that's uh, a huge, huge majority of the drivers are men. For example, a, a recent study in London showed that I think 98% of the cab drivers are men. Um, do you think that this has also an influence? And, uh, and when you hear people sometimes speaking, uh, they are really promoting kind of a sexual uh, segregation, for example, with the, the initiative, for example, of the, of the pink cap in London, only four women drive by women. What do you think about this kind of, uh, of experience? Uh, is it something that you, that you will promote? Yeah, um, I think, and this is just coming from the, from the Belgian context, um, I think it's really important that the diversity of the people that are taking um, the, the public transport, that that is reflected in the, the people who are, for example, driving uh, the, uh, like the, the, the bus drivers, etc. So there's really this, this empathy link between, um, between users and, uh, and drivers, for example. Um, that's why we, we really um, build on a strong cooperation with public transport sectors to, for example, diversify and focus specifically on, on recruiting um, male bus, uh, female bus drivers, um, but also not just on gender, but also on, on like uh, the other parts of, uh, of diversity. But that's, uh, that's a bit another matter. About your question uh, for um, segregated buses and transport, We've um, uh, actually come together with the with the entire gender uh, Belgian gender sector to to uh, to answer uh, to formulate an answer on that question because it's a really uh, interesting question and it's really I think it's the the answer is going to be diverse based on, on on your context maybe as well um, but we. Um, uh, we decided there that we, we will try not to go for this segregated um, uh, public transport, but instead really see the, um, uh, see the diversity of people uh, that are taking the bus, see the men that are on the bus as an ally, as a possible uh, intervening actor, um, someone, a, an active bystander who can, um, well, both men and uh, women and ex, Anyone who is on the bus can be a bystander, can be someone who intervenes um, to take action when they see sexual harassment. Thanks a lot, Walter. Very inspiring. Marie Axel, what will be your key recommendation to really tangle this, uh, this to, to really improve uh, uh, the, the safe experience for everybody in the mobility and especially women? Uh, my uh, key, um, my my key will be uh, on gender stereotypes and gender role. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that um, even we uh, change the transport and the public space and and, and so on. Uh, um, if we not change the gender stereotype and the gender role, the the problem will um, be there and continue to be there. Um, this is an important task, but um, because the, the gender stereotypes are uh, widely, widely shared around the world, uh, but um, this, this is, uh, I, I think this is a key. 
uh, we have to educate people to um, to interact to, together and we have to educate people uh, people uh, from the childhood to um, to see these beliefs are, are just beliefs uh, and um, some things that do not define them and uh, that uh, they have not to uh, comply with every time. Uh, and uh, in, in this stereotype, I think the, um, the world should, should focus uh, on the feeling of uh, vulnerability, which is felt too much by women and not enough by men. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that this is a partially responsible uh, for the woman's fear of transport and in the transport and in the public space. And at the same time, uh, it is a key for under, uh, understanding the men risky behavior. So women need to le learn that they are not vulnerable as they are told to, to be. And men need to learn that they are more vulnerable than, that, than, that they think. I think uh, the key is here for me. Thank you, Marie Axel. Mm -hmm. um, Naomi, uh, what's your perspective? What do you think about uh, Waters' statement on the fact that men should really be an ally on those questions? Um, um, maybe first I, I could address the issue of uh, women only transport. Mm -hmm. I think there have been several countries that have tried that intervention, including, I think, Cairo, Delhi, Mumbai. Uh, even metro systems have tried that. And um, I, I think that the segregation should be a temporary intervention. It should not be seen as a long-term solution, right? Because as I mentioned, for example, from our research, women are getting most uh, harassed, for example, while waiting for public transport, right? So we are only segregating them once they get into the vehicle. Right. So unless we plan to segregate them right from home, walking all the way to the bus stop, which is just impossible, I think we need a long term intervention into the issue. I agree that um, segregation is important. It offers short term relief for that time, but it should only be used while working on long term interventions. Um, on the issue of what would be the top three things that I would um, recommend is that we need to work on interventions informed by research and the experience of users and women professionals in the industry. Mm -hmm. And the question I would, many three questions I would ask the audience is, what is currently working in your country or in your urban area or in your town or in your village? What is not working? what do we want in terms of inclusivity? Then we can work backwards to now design the interventions. But most importantly, I would like to point out that for anyone in the African continent, this is an opportune time in transport. Um, investment in Africa's physical transport is forecasted like for this year to reach 69 billion. And this is just physical infrastructure which, for example, our Kenyan government is really big on. But there hasn't been deliberate investment in soft infrastructure. This is the social, the legal, the policies, right, which are just as important because what we'll end up with is investing a whole lot of money on physical infrastructure, but we leave out vulnerable groups who cannot access that very expensive physical infrastructure. So I would first start by saying conducting safety audits. We've had some, some success with engaging local agencies and authority once we started talking about physical infrastructure investment, right? And these uh, safety audits are not just about the road and public transport, but also, you know, citywide safety audits, um, training, and capacity building um, managers and operators, as I mentioned, on professionalism and gender rights mainstreaming. And um, lastly, I would say public awareness. Uh, unfortunately for us, it required women to protest in order to get the attention of the right people. Um, and I'm not you know, advocating for protest, uh, but some, it, it got the work done. <laughs> Um, and so it, it's looking at a national wide uh, public awareness and bringing the voices of the users into the right uh, boardrooms. 
Yeah. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Naomi. So if I really get the, the key points here, we really spoke about first the needs to have a global and holistic approach that is rights-based, but also evidence-based. And here, yes. you can somehow enhance the importance of research. We need to know more. Specifically, if you want to advocate, we need, we need the facts, we need the evidence. We need also to be able to monitor and to evaluate also the success or not of the key activity that you are willing to do. Mm. We need for that also to involve the people, to try to assess what are the gender-specific needs for everybody in order to, to build transport system that will definitely work in a safe way for everybody, in order for everybody to have also simple access to their rights. That we speak about health, education, uh, income generating activity, social life. For that, we really need to invest. And for that, we need definitely to work on the norms to, through awareness campaign, through different type of act, through education from the start, and also to have a serious component of uh, capacity building in the, the activity that we are that we are willing to to bring to that we are willing to to implement in order to improve the situation. I think that's a lot of uh, of key things also that definitely uh, relate to the work of uh, many people involved in the uh, in the classical let's say road safety dynamics. And I hope that uh, in the future um, it will be much more opportunities for. Uh, the different sector dealing with safety and mobility to work and interact together because like I think the three of you mentioned in your own way and I think that's come also from the public this holistic approach it's the only solution because basically it's the, the, the um, safety and on, on the, the issue of safety within the mobility system will not be solved by only a one single approach I think yeah. we, we do all agree on that um, I would like really to thank you for um, um, for your, all your intervention and your passion uh, that you have been sharing with us today. That's really inspiring uh, for me, but I think for everybody that will that did participate in this session and that will see this session later. I hope to for all the participants that it was just for some aspects uh, an eye opener and that that will really give you the need to dig more on those questions and to be to be very curious and to be uh, really willing to share those experience and project that we have discussed today for more experience in I see that there were people from so many countries all around so thanks a lot for joining us and uh, I think as we have to respect a little bit the time uh, I think I will I will hand over to to uh, the representative of the, the Global Alliance uh, that is for you around. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Eric. And uh, thank you, Mary, Mary, Mary Excel, Vata, and, and, and Naomi. Um, I think you're, it's been extremely interesting and a, a big eye opener for all of us. I'm, I'm very sure. Um, I think uh, you started off with a lot of evidence and research, which really was very dark and, and, and I think just looking at, at the magnitude of this problem and, and also the normalization of it. I think that was um, quite striking, I think, for a lot of us. So I'm really happy that we ended in, in, in some of the solutions both, uh, and also that you illustrated that some of them are, are short term uh, and it's important to both work on the short term and the long term solutions. Um, what we do with these sessions is that we do a write up of, uh, of a sort of a summary um, of what um, what have been said and, and some of the main points. Um, but you can also listen back to all the, these, um, these sessions uh, anytime you like, and I really encourage you to do that. Um, we're also putting all the resources up on the website, on our website. We're also sending them to all those who have attended. Um, so the recording is available, the resources are available. If you have additional resources, I saw some people were asking for the slides, for example, Marie Excel, if you're, if you're willing to share. I think they were very, very good and, and very pointed. So um, I, think, I think that would be extremely helpful um, for, for, for all of us. Um, you can also listen to sessions that we have had before, which are really interconnected with a lot of the issues that you took up, especially the one on inequalities. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of sort of parallels to this session. Um, thank you very much. We're just running over time here. Thank you very much for joining. Um, take care and, um, and thanks for extremely interesting session, all of you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks everybody and uh, see you next time. See you.
Thank you. Bye all. Thank you for joining.